words held waiting Rolled like thunder Off my tongue to the wild blue yonder And he put the kids out on a raft And he tied a roof to the raft And let it go out in the water and I used to say, you know, what happens to the kids that stay there? Don't go on the raft. And one day I found out what happened to the kids that stayed there. So he had them out on the raft so you know where they were. Then he'd take people like me, a child like me, back into his truck. And he says Chapman threatened him. I've seen pictures where he had children tied to trees. And I'm sure they were dead children. They told me I'd be like that too if I ever said anything. He'd kill my family. He'd kill my mother. And the guy completely wrecked my life. I want him to know he was my boogeyman for 40 years, but I'm going to be his boogeyman for the rest of his life. This is the life and story of a predator named Wayne Chapman, who has saved around 100 children and was suspected in the murder of Andy Puglisi. He was a monster that would lure his victims into the woods and then attack them. Wayne Chapman was born to dysfunctional parents in Jamestown, Massachusetts. His mother, Betty, was hooked on drugs that made you sleep constantly. His father, Arthur, was a truck driver who was mostly not at home. But when he was home, he would drink and beat his children relentlessly. When Wayne was around four years old, he would often wet the bed and he would hide the sheets to keep from getting beat by his dad. One cold winter night, his dad got out of bed to find him hiding his bed sheets, and Arthur was furious. Arthur immediately ordered Wayne out the back door in the dead of winter to stand in the snow. Clad in nothing but a bed shirt, the four-year-old shivered in the darkness on a mound of snow about seven inches deep. Wayne was only allowed to come in to warm up when he assured his father the bed wetting would stop. Wayne would never look at his father the same again. His father would constantly beat his mother. And Wayne was always a witness to much of the beatings. Wayne battled through polio, which left him with a permanent limp. And his father would say this messed Wayne's brain up. So basically he had Wayne brain. Wayne brain. Sorry if your name's Wayne. But that's what he had. He had Wayne brain according to his dad. Nothing worse than a Wayne brain. I don't guess. I don't know. Sorry, Wayne. When Wayne was around four or five years old, some little neighborhood girls got a little curious about what Wayne might look like. They made him disrobe so they could look at him. Wayne recalled, no contact in this incident, but it still excited him. Around age eight, young Wayne was already having problems in school. Wayne would later confess that he was being bullied in school. Wayne would often skip classes to hide under a local bridge close to his grade school. He did not pay close attention to his hygiene and often was very stinky. At age seven, Wayne was already fantasizing about boys his age. Wayne had not yet acted on those fantasies. Instead, he turned his anger outward. Young Wayne would torture animals. He would lock cats in boxes in the woods and watch the boxes as the cats slowly starved. Wayne would use bricks to crush cats. Then the young boy would observe them bleed out. Wayne would have fantasies about fondling his classmates and then become so full of rage over not having the opportunity to act on it, he would take it out on the neighborhood pets. Right before he turned eight, he essayed a five-year-old boy. Around fourth grade, he realized he was only attracted to young boys. Wayne was already examining other boys' bodies, classmates from school, even his younger brother's bodies. Wayne Chapman was consumed by his fantasies. At 15, he began exploring these feelings with older men, but it wasn't very fulfilling to him because he was just attracted to children. At 16, Wayne quit school and moved out of his parents' home after having a fight with his parents because he had tried to mess with his four-year-old brother. After he left home, he was able to find jobs, but he couldn't keep them due to his body odor and bizarre behavior. In 1965, when Wayne was 18, Wayne had his eyes on a pair of young, brown-eyed, brown-haired boys. That was his favorite. He had been stalking them at the local park. The boys were able to escape 
after Wayne had lured them into the woods. Due to his low IQ, it would take him many times to learn from his mistakes, and he would end up in jail a few times after several failed attempts. In the summer of 1969, Wayne lured a 10-year-old boy into the woods somewhere in New York State. He essayed the young boy. During the process, the boy beat him in his private area. Wayne was so angry that he tied the boy to a tree with a gag in his mouth and he simply walked away. The same as he had done to the cats as a youth, locking them in boxes in the woods and walking away. It is unclear to this day what happened to this young boy. He was now encouraged by getting away with the essay in New York State. The fact that weeks later the police hadn't yet come for him, he figured the boy probably died out there. He would soon figure out if he told boys he had lost his puppy, he could isolate the boys from their friend group. On December 6, 1971, Wayne isolated a boy with this ruse and changed his life forever. Wayne essayed a young boy in the wooded area. After he finished, Wayne whipped out his camera from his right pocket and took photos of the boy. Wayne, at this point, was a prolific producer of child images. He used his crimes not only to gratify his despicable urges, but also to make sure he had photo evidence for trading around or looking at later. Of course, this was before the internet, so the sicko actually had to hand trade pictures. Incredibly, even though the boy was able to identify Wayne, he was not sentenced to jail for these crimes. Instead, Wayne was placed on indefinite probation. Under the condition, he sought psychiatric help. From December 1971 to late March of 1973, Wayne was under intense psychiatric care. Wayne figured it would benefit him to find someone to shack up with, to give the outside world the impression of a typical kind of guy. So it would be easier to commit crimes, and he thought a plus would be if the woman had children already. So in 1971, Wayne married a 43-year-old woman with two young boys, age 11 and 14. Wayne had only been 23, 20 years younger than the woman. He did not even try to have relations with his new wife. She was often angry at Wayne's inability to perform. Wayne's new stepsons were on to him early. They hated him. The two boys would often throw things at him and beg their mother to send this creep back to wherever she found him. They thought he was very weird. He asked inappropriate questions, and he always wanted to lay on the couch with them, even sleep in their beds. Wayne eventually started essaying both boys. He would often grope the 11-year-old while he slept, and he would aggressively advance himself on the 14-year-old. Even though he grew tired of the situation and eventually left his wife, she never divorced him. They still communicated at least until 2015, they were known to communicate. So they stayed friends for a long time, even after her boys were aside. I don't get it, but I think her boys, according to what I found, were put into the foster care system. So she must not have been a great mother, but I don't know. I don't know. I could be wrong on this, but this is what I read on one of the articles that they were put in the foster care system. On June 1974, five-year-old David Lewison went missing. He was from Brockton, Massachusetts, and he disappeared playing in his own backyard while his mom was making dinner. David's body turned up in a steamer trunk, but not until 1980. Authorities discovered the chest in the basement of 47 Highland Street in Brockton, Massachusetts, although it was thought that Wayne had been responsible for his death due to lack of evidence the murder charges were dropped. Labor Day weekend, 1975, Ron and Jill Newton were camping in Maine with their four-year-old son, Kurt, who was happily riding his tricycle while his dad was cutting wood for the fire. Mom was hanging clothes and did not see Kurt ride off on his trike down a dirt road. Ron and Jill immediately ran from campsite to campsite asking campers if they saw the blonde-haired boy peddling tricycle. The game warden was contacted, and he figured the boy had wandered off in the woods and just had become lost. A helicopter was sent up to look for Kurt. People in town came to the woods to search for the boy. Little Kurt Newton never came home. Nothing was ever found of Kurt either, not a single shred of clothing. He disappeared off the face of the planet. 
The same goes for little Douglas Chapman, no relation to Wayne. And he was from Alfred, Maine. Chapman disappeared from just in front of his family's home on June 2nd, 1971. Wayne would often tell authorities, no body, no crime. He would later brag about meeting boys at campsites in Maine. He was known to frequent the area, even though it could never be proven that Wayne had abducted these boys. Wayne would frequent a swimming pool in Lawrence, Massachusetts during the summer of 1975. Wayne had been tipped off to the easy access of children at the pool by somebody familiar with Wayne. Many people believe it to be Charles Pierce, who was another predator that frequented that area in the 70s. Pierce liked to murder children first before he essayed them. Wayne lured two boys aged 10 and 11 away from the swimming pool by telling them he had lost his dog. He took a route only a local would know from Crawford Street over to Den Rock Park and told the boys they should split up to cover more ground while looking for his dog. But one boy sensed something wasn't quite right and refused to split up, so he remained in harm's way because of his love and concern for his friend. During this encounter, Wayne had a knife with him, which he dropped during the attack. He essayed both boys several times in different ways and then threatened them with the knife to not tell. But they did as soon as they made it home. They told. They ratted him out. But unfortunately, he still didn't get caught. I guess they couldn't ID him good enough for him to be found. Wayne even used to tape record himself discussing his crimes. On one recording, Wayne can be heard breathing heavily. Oh, so disgusting. A school bus can be heard driving in the background. At one point, he lets out an inaudible yelp when talking about getting into some of the stuff that's in those buses. Oh. Wayne goes on to discuss the feeling he gets when he commits an assault. Just a truly disturbing monster singular incident that would propel Wayne Chapman into local and national news was the disappearance of 10-year-old Andy Puglisi from the Higgins Memorial Pool in Lawrence at the same pool where he had abducted the other two boys. On a hot August day in 1976, Andy and his friend Melanie were playing at the pool. What wasn't known till later was that there were five predators at that pool that day. Wayne being one of them. Melanie went home to eat sometime in the mid-afternoon while Andy stayed at the pool. Around 3.30 that afternoon, Andy made a phone call home. His brother stated that he seemed fine. Nothing was off about the phone call. When Andy's mother, Faith, realized her son didn't come home with his siblings, she began to panic, as all moms would do. Can you imagine? That would be so scary. I, I can't even imagine. She reported to police that her 10-year-old son hadn't arrived home from the pool. A search was started and even a psychic was brought in, but the search for Andy was called off after an exhausting six days with no sign of the young boy. At first, as in all child cases, Andy's family was suspected, but they all passed a polygraph test. It was not until a traffic stop in Waterloo, New York, that the picture started to become apparent. Wayne had a mountain of child images in the van that day. You know, the typical R.A.P.E. van, as we call it. And in that van, during that traffic stop, he also had rope, fake police badges, state-of-the-art camera equipment for back then, and socks. Bloody knee-length socks with wool fabric, which Andy's mother said that Andy had been wearing. She remembered this because they were his sister's socks. That he had put on and the other boys were making fun of him for wearing the socks. Routine blood tests allegedly were conducted on the sock, but the results as well as the sock have now been lost. Also in the van was the tape of Wayne talking to himself about obscene acts he had liked to perform on the boys. He was also linked to the area that day by receipts that were found. A witness told authorities that he and another boy found a large pit in the woods near the pool. The friend stated that the hole could have been large enough to hold a child's body. When he returned to that same area a few days later, the pit had been filled in. This spot has never been proven to be a gravesite. Wayne worked as a janitor at Miriam Hospital during the time Andy was abducted. His job there included incinerating amputated body parts, 
Some unauthorized burnings occurred around the time Andy disappeared. The possibility would have existed for him to dispose of a body that way, although it was never proven. After Wayne's arrest, he was interviewed. After he was given some truth serum, Wayne detailed what happened to Andy in excruciating detail. But the short, less graphic version is he lured Andy to the woods where he tied him to a tree while essaying him. He started bleeding from his backside and wasn't moving. He also confessed to the abductions of the two boys that were abducted at that same pool and had got away. In May of 1977, the two boys told their story to a grand jury. Just about a year after Andy's disappearance, Wayne was found guilty of the essay of the two Lawrence boys and sentenced to two concurrent 15 to 30 year sentences. But Wayne had still not been sentenced for any past murders, including Andy's. The lifeguard at the pool the day Andy went missing actually testified to recognizing Wayne as being the man that had walked off that day with a young boy. She said he had even came back the next day and asked her why search parties were scouring the area. A boy would come forward years later and claim that he and Andy were actually abducted together. The boy was just four years old in 1976. He stated that he and Andy agreed to help Wayne Chapman find his lost dog. When they arrived in the woods, Andy immediately became suspicious and saw two other men hiding in the bushes. Andy sensed that an ambush was set. Andy immediately screamed for his friend to run away. Andy even ran behind this young boy to push him further down the trail and out of the woods. When the little boy crested the top of the hill he was on, he turned around to locate Andy in his field of vision. Once he discovered Andy, he saw two men lording over him. He was pinned under a large boulder with the weight of two fully grown men on top of it. Incredibly, this boy's report is nowhere to be found in Lawrence Police Files. Unfortunately, during the subsequent years after Andy's disappearance, many pieces of evidence would simply go missing, including those socks. And Wayne denied any omission of guilt he had given in the past. Wayne had been admitted to Bridgewater Treatment Center at the same time as Charles Pierce and another predator. I'm sure you have heard of Nathaniel Barjona. Wayne started saying about Andy's abduction that the only time he had been in Lawrence was when he pulled off the road there after a long drive to rest. Weirdly, Barjona offered the same exact explanation when asked if he was near the day of Andy's disappearance. He stated he was passing through and got off the road to eat and then saddled right back up on the road. Two men who did not know each other allegedly had the exact same story of their whereabouts on the day around when Andy disappeared. But it is said that there is no way Barjona was at Higgins Memorial Pool that day. It's just way too recognizable for someone not to remember him. I mean, Barjona was extremely heavy with a large beard. Anyone present at the pool that day who laid eyes on Barjona would have definitely recognized him, been able to identify Barjona. But could he have still been nearby? Maybe he didn't abduct the boy, but he could have been nearby hiding. The two boys that Wayne had been convicted for stated to officers that they had heard someone in the bushes taking pictures while they were being essayed by Wayne. Odd, that involves somebody else. Could that have been Barjona, perhaps? Wayne and Barjona were so close on the outside that Wayne was instrumental in Barjona being committed to Bridgewater. When Wayne arrived in Bridgewater, he began writing to Barjona, serving his 18 to 20 year sentence in Walpole and teaching him the right things to say in order to get moved over to Bridgewater where he was. And it worked. Wayne Chapman lived out most of his retirement years shuttled back and forth between Bridgewater Treatment Center and Norfolk County Correctional Facility in Gardner, Massachusetts. In 2019, he was let out of prison in a wheelchair because he had tons of health problems and also because mental health professionals determined he was not sexually dangerous anymore. He had never been convicted of Andy's abduction and Andy's body was never found. 
Wayne died of natural causes in a nursing home in Connecticut at age 73 in 2021. Although he admitted to essaying at least 100 victims, he would never admit to murder. Just on a side note, NAMBLA, which stands for North America Man Boy Love Association, was started in Massachusetts in 1978, around the same time as Wayne Chapman stalking Massachusetts. Nobody outside the FBI really had an inside look into Nambla until the 1993 film Chicken Hawk was released. It is a documentary about men discussing their attraction to children, and it is truly disturbing. I tried to watch it. I did not finish it. You can actually find it on YouTube. It's called Chicken Hawk. One thing that this documentary did do, it made FBI realize how rampant this kind of thing was and that they needed to get on the ball when it came to investigating this stuff because it was getting out of hand because these predators didn't have internet like they do today. Nambula made for a gathering place for these predators to meet where they could discuss their disturbing fantasies and stories of their victims and trade images. Wayne Chapman lived during a time where lack of knowledge about DNA allowed these predators to get away with more. If Andy Salk had not been lost because of the advancements in DNA, we would have known if Wayne actually committed the murder of Andy. But because they lost the Salk, we will never know. I'm not sure if his body will ever be found at this point. It's just sad for his family, sad for all the victims, all these things that was done to this victims by this man just this was this was a disgusting man that actually I didn't see much on YouTube about him I mean Andy Puglisi it talks about him but it doesn't really go into detail about Wayne Chapman and I figure if we can learn more about these predators we can actually you know know how they work you know I mean people don't always want to listen to stuff but sometimes we need to know what their brain is thinking and Maybe it'll help us protect children in the future. Anyway, I do love you guys, and I hope y'all have a blessed week. I just hope you just be kind to others out there. Like I say, always, you never know what they've been through. And I do love y'all, and I thank you for supporting my channel. You're just all such a blessing to me. Have a great day. Bye. Wayne Chapman was born to a dysfunctional parent. Dysfunctional parents in Jamestown, Massachusetts. Who shits? My accent, I hate it. It's not Massachusetts. Sorry, Massachusetts. 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 I'm going to say this. I'm sorry. I cannot pronounce your state. I'm just sorry. Hello, my little friends. Welcome to the murder shit shed. Shit shed where we learn all new things. You are in the way again. Oh my god, I hate this thing. I think my other thing was actually more reliable than this stupid thing I got. And that was handmade by me. Might have put it back on there. I don't know what Wayne Brain is. Sorry if your name's Wayne. I just said it rhymes, so I just said it. He had Wayne Brain. Doesn't sound like a good thing though to have Wayne Brain. I don't know, but that's what he had according to his dad. He did not pay close attention to his hygiene and was often very stinky. Stinky wine. No, uh, insane wine, but stank wine? No, they don't rhyme either. Stank wine. Wine stank. I get sidetracked sometimes. I mean, too. It just happens. Okay, let me try that again. Try that again. Anyway, I just wanted to remind y'all that I did have this Facebook and TikTok. If you can support me in that way, it would be great. I'm trying to get word out here that I am on YouTube. Probably won't have any Simon bloopers today unless I record him when I go in the house because he is asleep on the couch. Run the four-wheeler all day. We've been goofing off outside all day and so he's a tired boy and now I gotta go cook dinner before my husband comes out here and he's starving because apparently he's helpless, you know. How kitchen things work, you know. Got a man like that. And although at fire department, he can always manage to grill or something. And when it's his turn, he can manage to cook, but homie just really, he forgets how to cook, I think. For some reason that he has a, he has a brain fart, and he just loses all ideas of how the stove turns on when he comes home. I better go cook dinner before I hear him talking about his hunger pains. I don't, so helpless sometimes. 
When time it called me darling In catmint shaded the garden 